when we were da- when we were singing dance with me and dancing to it and we had our scriptures i was thinking about how romantic torah study actually is i mean even just going up to the bima making aliyah to read a section of the torah that is a very romantic act between us and our bridegroom yeshua because uh yeshua he is like he's the living torah eh? and it says in Luke, I think it's chapter 4, that he had, he had a custom of going to the synagogue on Shabbat. That's what he did growing up in his hometown, Nazareth. And, uh, you know, when he went, when he went back with his, uh, troop of disciples and visited his hometown, that's what he did. And it says that he went up and then he gave a Devar Torah. He, he, uh, started explaining some things. And it says they were amazed at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. And you know, like when we go up to read from the Torah, he is present in our midst. He is the one who is who is illuminating the word to us. And, and we can all just be amazed at the gracious words falling from the lips of the Master Yeshua. You know, as, as we go up and we read from the Torah. Um, I mean, like, what's the essence of dance? The essence of dance is, is two moving as one. Right? Two people moving like they're echad. And you know what? That's exactly what it is. We have a savior who went to the synagogue every Shabbat, who made Aliyah to read from the holy texts. And, and when we come to synagogue on Shabbat, when we, uh, when we go up to read from the, uh, from the Bima, it's like we are moving as one with Yeshua over, over a span of time, spanning generations. It's like you transcend time on Shabbat. And you just enter into that spiritual dimension where it's him and you, and you are moving as one. You are you're imitating the rabbi. Yeah, think about that. You know, for us as the bride, we are we are being given like white linen garments. Um, we are we are preparing our wedding dress for the return of our Savior. And uh, part of that, I believe, is this awakening in the body of Messiah to the value of the Torah. In our lifestyles, uh, understanding how it points to Yeshua and glorifies Him. Understanding how when He comes back, we're going to be doing this stuff with Yeshua. He is going to be leading the nation in a revival, not only of like the Holy Spirit and the glory of God in the midst of His people, but He is going to lead us in a revival of the, applying the Pentateuch to our lives again. And there are so many prophetic scriptures when, if read literally to any degree, indicate that that's going to be the case. So you know what? I'm I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. We're in the middle of that dance right now. Um, Yeah, let's let's turn to um, Deuteronomy 33 together. And we'll we'll look at some verses. Uh, I'm going to be commenting on something this morning that I have not had nearly as much experience in as uh, some of of you here. Um, You know, as a... As a young husband and father, I've begun to think in new terms, in terms of caring for a family, in terms of raising children. I mean, it, it's a new, it's a new uh, framework really for me. And I've really begun to think about how do, uh, how do I want to raise my children? You know, we talked about that on Yom Kippur. What, 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 what legacy do I want to leave for the generations to come? You know, for my, I assume probably there will be hundreds of great, great, great grandchildren. For my hundreds of great, great, great grandchildren, are they even going to know about me? What are they going to know about their great, great, great grandfather who lived a hundred or 150 years ago? You know, um, I'm beginning to, I'm beginning to learn to think generationally. And uh, so I want to talk today based on this parsha about leaving a legacy. We, uh, we read in Deuteronomy 33 verse 1, it says, Now this is the blessing with which Moshe, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel, when? Before his death. So we see that before Moshe died, he left a legacy to the people of Israel. And uh, I look up to Moshe in that regard. That is, that is a very simple act that he did that we can each do also. We can be thinking about. And uh, as, as we learn, you know, a legacy doesn't only mean in immediate families in terms of children and grandchildren. A legacy can be left in terms of the people that we, we mentor, that we disciple on a spiritual level. It can be a legacy that we leave at work or uh, in our community here in Prince Albert. Every one of us are going to leave a legacy. Yeah. And so we're going to look at a couple of things, uh, a couple of details of this legacy that Moses left to the nation that continues to uh, impact us to a very high degree even now. Um, in our culture, I, I don't see us thinking very generationally often. You know, I, we have this human tendency to live quite selfishly, right? I think about me, myself, and I most of the time, and uh, you know that. And, and you know, when I die, well, I'm gone, you know, and I'll I'll, I'll leave my stuff to some people. And I, I don't know, like sometimes we focus more on the now than on on like let's say a century from now you know it's kind of a antithetical to that uh, 
First Nations proverb, the Cherokee proverb, that you know, with every, with every decision that we deliberate about, we should seriously contemplate what effect is this going to have to the seventh generation. That, that's a First Nations um, axiom, and uh, one that I think we would do well to uh, c- consider also. Um, that, that's something that I believe uh, the Father is, is calling us back to, to think in those terms. I really like Proverbs 13, verse 22. It's the antithesis to this kind of selfish, like, thinking about me now concept. It says, the good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So, you know, the good man, he leaves an inheritance not only for his children, but for his grandchildren. And I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe an even greater degree of a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children's children. Could it be? I, I, I think so. Um, I, I want to give you a couple little examples here of, of, of a concrete inheritance that was left to me by my grandfather. It's, a, it's part of the inheritance that was left to me by my maternal grandfather as a, one of his children's children. He uh, left me his tools. And, uh, you know, as, as someone who has a background in construction, who enjoys working with his hands, my grandfather... Inheriting my grandfather's tools was a very meaningful, literal element of a legacy. I didn't bring all the tools. Some of them are pretty sizable. But uh, that's something that he left me. Something else that my grandfather left me was... Uh, my grandfather was a Baptist pastor and evangelist. And uh, he left me his Hebrew Bible, his Tanakh. Um, and it's marked up pretty nice, actually. He... He spent time in this thing. Check this out. Can you see that page? He used pink marker all over the place. Like, wow, that really jumps out. Actually, sometimes I use pink highlighters too. Maybe I inherited that from my grandpa, I don't know. So, you know, this is just a a little... This is something that I... This is one of my most treasured possessions. You know, as a Hebrew scholar, as someone who has a passion to teach biblical Hebrew to the body of Messiah, to help us understand the Torah, understand the Jewishness of Jesus, like, this is a treasure, eh? It represents so much to me. Um, it's, it's part of the legacy that my grandfather, uh, left to me. Um, actually, this here is a, another one of his books. This is his Hebrew grammar book, Essentials of Biblical Hebrew, um, um, by an author named Kyle Yates, Ph.D., published in 1938. Um, this is the book that my grandfather learned Hebrew on when he went to seminary in, in Saskatoon. And actually, I didn't inherit this. Um, I taught a couple series of biblical Hebrew classes in my grandfather's Baptist church in North Battleford. And uh, one day I went into his old office, and there were still shelves of books there that had just been left there um, the church isn't like a very busy place at this point, so um, they just, they, they're just they still just sitting there. And I was just looking through my grandpa's old books, and I came across this, his Hebrew grammar. It's like, so, of course, you know, I contacted the, the, the now-acting pastor immediately, and I was like, can I have this? And he said I could, of course. He, he's a very uh, dear family friend. And I mean, like, this is just a gem. Actually, I'm, this, this book is going to be a significant contributor to the Hebrew course that I'm producing. Um, it's going to be part of the template that we use. So, in, in some regards, this is part of the legacy that my paternal grandfather left not only to me, but to the body of Messiah, because this is going to go to thousands, and I pray tens and hundreds of thousands of people through the Hebrew course. Um, so, you know, these, these, these are a couple examples of uh, legacies that, that have been left in, in my life. I wanted to share that with you all because you're my friends. You wonder if our forefathers thought, in terms of seven generations, how that would look now, eh? Or even here in Prince Albert. What if the founders of Prince Albert had thought generationally? Some of them did, absolutely. Some of them didn't. Some of them were more there to take than to give, I think. And then, but we're here, you know what, we're here to, to help change that, aren't we? We're here to turn a tide. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to talk really practically for a couple of minutes about leaving a legacy. Some of the things that I'm learning, like, I almost feel unqualified to talk about this. I'm very young in terms of like, you know, being, being an Abba. Um, I have one daughter. But, uh, and some of you, like, you have, you have children, you have grandchildren, and, uh, well, you're like Tears' honorary grandparents too. But, you know, I, I want to share this as something that I'm learning on a very personal level. Um, sometimes, you know, when you have someone who's just learning something, they're the best equipped to teach it because it's so new to them, because it's so, it's so alive in their hearts, you know. So, so, um, I, I just, I'll, I'll share this with great respect to those of you who are my elders here. Um, 
Here are a couple of practical things that I've been learning about what we can do to leave lasting legacies, not only to our children and grandchildren, but to those we're mentoring, those we're having a significant influence on. Um, we're going to talk about the how, the what, the when, and the who of blessing, of leave, leaving a legacy. Firstly, in, uh, and Moshe is going to be our, our teacher here, uh, the first thing we see is that Moshe, our teacher, spoke a blessing to the people of Israel. He didn't just think it. He, he spoke that blessing. He verbally communicated the blessing. And uh, for us, that could be in prayer. Often prayer is an excellent time to speak a blessing over someone. Um, sometimes it's more comfortable for us too, you know. It's, it's a pretty personal thing to speak a blessing to someone, you know. So, you know, you can close your eyes then. And, uh, and maybe it's more comfortable to pray a blessing for someone because you can close your eyes, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, another thing you could do though is you can, if you, you could put your hand on that person's shoulder and you could look them in the eye and you could speak that blessing over them. That's the kind of thing that people never forget. Really. I mean, there's a deep bond that happens and it's very spiritually powerful. Um, we also learn from this parsha that Moshe didn't only speak the blessing, he went and he wrote that blessing down. So that that generation could remember it long after he was gone. So that future generations could remember the blessing that he left to the tribes of Israel. Um, that's another thing we could do. You can, you can write down blessings for your children, your grandchildren. What if you wrote down a blessing and you left that as an inheritance to your great-great-grandchildren? What if you wrote a blessing specifically for your great-great-grandchildren? I, I guarantee you that's the kind of thing that will, will survive over a hundred years. You know, and that will be carried on to deliver to those great-great-grandchildren. I mean, what kind of impact would that have on a future generation? You know, I'm just, I'm just thinking creatively here, right? What if we really thought outside of the box? Yeah. Um, I, I see how we really, we do that in our culture. We have ways of doing that. Um, for instance, on birthdays, um, often we will write a meaningful note in a birthday card. We will write a blessing in a birthday card. And um, I think that's a, that's a great way to do that. I, I have a couple cards here that I just wanted to show you that are uh, some, some of my other greatest treasures. I, I have a box with the, uh, the, the cards that my, my grandparents and my parents and my, uh, my, my brothers have, have given me over the years. And uh, here are a couple of them. Here's a card that my brother Colin made for me. He, he drew this gorgeous picture of Israel and flowing vines and things. But, uh, you know, so this is an example of uh, how even in our culture, it's, 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 it comes very naturally to write a blessing and put it in a card. And that is a keepsake that people will hopefully keep for many years to come. It's, uh, you know, these cards that have been given to me are some of my most precious possessions. Really, you know, like 50 years from now, God willing that I still have them, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the blessings that my grandparents gave me. You know, um, here's one that my mom gave me. My mom likes to take pictures and then put text on them, meaningful pictures. So this one, it says, Israel, Yahweh slash Yeshua is your rock. And I think it's a picture of a rock from, I don't know, maybe from Israel or somewhere. Actually, that looks like the rock pond close to her house. But anyway, it's like a big rock, right? And, uh, and then she has some encouragement and a blessing in there that she, uh, that she wrote to me. Um, here's an encouraging blessing card from my, uh, from my wife. Happy birthday to someone who has touched oh so many lives. I hope you don't have it cute cootie. And then she wrote an encouraging note in there, you know? I mean, um, that was a blessing for sure. And then I have a couple in here too from my mom, from my, there's a letter from my mom that I used as a bookmark. Um, when I first went to Israel, she wrote me a blessing. And she said, read this on the plane as you're flying to Israel. So, you know, I was, I was busy reading through my Hebrew dictionary on the plane. And then I, I took some time, just some special time to read that letter. And I, I, I used that as a bookmark in my scriptures for several years after that. You know, it's a, it's, it's a very encouraging. I have another uh, card in here from my grandparents that they gave us for our Genevieve's in my recent trip to Israel, where they just, uh, they wrote a blessing in that card, and they gave that to us for our trip, you know. So, uh, yeah, these are some examples from my life of how writing down a blessing has been such a, such an encouragement, such a lasting, a lasting influence, such a, such a treasure. Um, okay, so that's, that's part of the how of blessing. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, what about the what of blessing? Uh, what did Moses say to bless the tribes of Israel? Maybe we can talk about that. What, what, what could you include in the content of a blessing? Um, when, we, when we study this passage, what we see is that uh, Moshe emphasized each tribe's strengths. 
and abilities. He pointed out, you know, this is, this is one of your strengths as a tribe. This is a special capability that you have. And, and that's an excellent thing to key in on when you're blessing someone. Uh, point out that person's strengths, the things that they're good at. Um, especially, you know, for if you're close to someone, if you uh, have watched that person growing up, you know very well what, the, what that person is good at. And that's something to really reinforce in a person, to, uh, to encourage them in. Um, also, as, a, as priests in our families, we can bless our families with the, the Birkat Kohanim, the, the priestly blessing. Years before I met Genevieve, every night when I go to bed, I would, uh, I would say the Shema, and then I would pray the priestly blessing for my future spouse. Every night. That was just something I did. I would pray for my future spouse every night when I went to bed. Um, you know, that's something that we can do. Uh, whether we have spouses or whether or not we don't. Or, uh, you know, whether we have children or not. We can begin praying right now. Because prayers are not bound by time. It's like you're storing up prayers in that prayer bank, eh? And, uh, and then, you know, when the Almighty needs to, He's going to access those prayers and He's going to, He's going to operate on their basis. Um, the, the priestly blessing. It's like, I believe it is one of the secret power centers of the nation. You know, if, uh, in my truck, I have a 7.2 uh, liter diesel engine, right? That's like the engine of my truck. I believe that blessing, uh, in general, in the Birkat Kornim, the, the priestly blessing specifically, it's like the engine that helps Keep our nation going. Because like we read, you know, all of these promises, they, they, are, they are true in our lives through Yeshua. It's, it's the core of the gospel. It doesn't say, but I, I wonder if he blessed the children with the Birkat Kohanim. I, what do you think? They definitely are. There is a prophetic element of those blessings. You, know, you see even in the lives of the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, before they died, the prophetic spirit, the, the Ruach HaKodesh would come on them and they would give prophecies to each of their children. And I think that can be true in our lives. Even for those of us who maybe don't operate on a regular basis in the gift of prophecy, uh, Jewish tradition says there's, there's, there's this special time before you die when you'll when you'll have that prophetic inspiration. And uh, that's a time to speak to your children, to speak into their futures. Yeah, and I mean, hey, as it was with the fathers, so it can be with the children, hey? Um, so that's the what. What, 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 can, what is some of the content that we could have in blessings that we leave as legacies? Uh, here's another question. When? When is a good time to bless? Um, you know what? I would say every Arab Shabbat is the best time to bless. Because you know, you're, you're stopping your regular weekday activities. Um, you're beginning to focus spiritually. Uh, you're coming together as a family, hopefully, uh, for that delicious Erev Shabbat supper. Um, it's a good time to bless. Um, I, I think that Erev Shabbat is another one of those power centers of our nation. It's the backbone of, of our nation, really. It's, it's, it's like the, uh, the core of family life. Yeah. So what a perfect time to, 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 to bless. And you know what? Your children or grandchildren or people that you're mentoring, they don't have to be there on Erev Shabbat for you to bless them, do they? Yeah. You know, uh, as long as it's from your mouth to his ear then he's going to act on your behalf in your family's life. And, and that's what counts. Um, here, here are a couple other ideas. You could write a special yearly letter or card for people that you want to leave a lasting legacy with. Um, maybe on Rosh Hashanah would be a good time. Looking back at that person's last year, uh, the triumphs and challenges of the year, anticipating that upcoming year of life. You know, can you imagine if, uh, you know, there's just a, a patriarch or a matriarch in the family who, who wrote a special letter to each of the children or grandchildren every year, saying, you know, how was, this was a great year for you. Here's some challenges and triumphs that you faced in this last year. And I, I pray the best for you in the upcoming year. You know, something like that, man. Like, wow, that is, that is powerful. That is coming to, that is coming into our call as, as, as patriarchs and as matriarchs in, in the, in, in, in our families and in our faith communities. Um, here's, here's another question. Uh, who, who, who could you bless? And we already covered most of that. You know, starting with children, grandchildren, um, even for, for uh, those who are, who are yet to come, um, praying for the future spouses of your children and grandchildren. From the age of one or two years old, my dad and my mom were praying for Genevieve. Yeah. They were. They were, they were praying for, uh, for my future spouse from like when I was a little kid in, in diapers, you know. Um, that, that's something that you can do. Pray for future spouses and their families. Um, you can, uh, in, the, in the words of the Torah, you can bless, quote, those who are here with us today and those who aren't here with us. Not only the generations that exist, but what about the ones to come? You know, like we talked about. What about the sixth and seventh generation? Why not pray for them? Those who aren't with you that day. Yeah. Um, 
And then, as we also mentioned, you can bless your spiritual children. We see many examples of this. Paul, for instance, he had spiritual sons. And sometimes that bond can even be stronger than a biological link. You know, we can ask the Father, Father, who do you want me to take under my wing? Who do you want me to to mentor to some degree? Who do you want me to to bless on a regular basis and uh, leave a lasting legacy to you? I I guarantee you, you know, when we begin asking him questions like this, he's going to bring people into our lives. I mean, like, we live in a world of fatherless people. Um, my generation is a fatherless generation. And you know what? God is a father to the fatherless. And he wants to express that. And he's a mother to the motherless too, isn't he? He wants, he wants to express that through us as his people. So when we begin making ourselves available and asking him to bring people to us, he's going to do it. He is going to do it. Um, you know, you might want to, like, adopt someone and start praying for that person and blessing them every year of Shabbat, whether they're there or not, you know? Um, and, and tell them, I, I'm praying for you every year of Shabbat. I'm going to adopt you and start bl- saying the Birkat Kohanim for you every year of Shabbat. You know? those, are, those are a couple of ideas that uh, we may want to prayerfully consider in the next couple of days, how we can implement those in our lives, in, in the legacy that, uh, that we leave to uh, future generations. Uh, what, what we learn from this parasha is that a prayerful blessing from a man or woman of God is the greatest legacy that can be conferred upon the generations to come. So I'm just going to take you, that was like kind of the main topic. I want to take you on an overview of this parasha, draw out a couple of the main elements also. And um, so if you're ready to go with me there, in uh, Deuteron- in um, 1 verse 3, that should say 33. Yeah, 33 verse 1. It says that, uh, that Yahweh came um, like in the midst of ten thousands of holy ones. And the interesting thing is that word for came, it isn't the word bo, which is usually used, it's the word ata, which is spelled aleph and tav as the root. So the word there for coming is aleph and tav. And who is the aleph and tav? What did a rabbi say about himself? He is the aleph and the tav. So we see here a very clear reference to Yeshua. In this, in this uh, introduction, like this, that he gives before these blessings for each tribe, it's so packed with messianic layers. Like, you wouldn't believe it. I'm just gonna try and like peel a couple of them off here for us. Uh, that's one of them. And, uh, who is Yeshua coming with when he comes back? Yep, he's coming with tens of thousands of the holy angels, isn't he? You know, when Yeshua, when Yeshua would teach, he, uh, he would very frequently reference concepts found in the Tanakh, right? Uh, that, was the, that was his grid. That was the grid of the people that he was addressing. And so, you know, you have to question, where did he get this idea that he's going to come back with, uh, with, with uh, myriads of his father's holy angels? Well, he got that probably from this Parsha. Yeshua knew that he was the Oliph and Tav. So where that, where that grammatical term, et, shows up. I, I, I believe that Yeshua knew that that was often pointing to him as the direct object of the father's actions. And... Uh, and uh, in, in that regard, I, I believe that when Yeshua, when the Master was studying through the Torah, he would come to a passage like that, and it would tell him something about himself. And uh, those early generations of the Master's disciples who studied the Hebrew Torah, these are the kind of things that they ate up. Like, you know, when you read certain passages, for instance, in Hebrews, you can tell, like, these guys were going deep in studying the Torah uh, from a Messianic viewpoint. So uh, that, that's a little example of that. In uh, 1 verse 2, uh, we read in Hebrew... Miyimi no eshdat lamo. He he came um, with a. How does it read in the NASB? At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. Um, that's not probably the best translation. Uh, that Hebrew term there translated as flashing lightning is eshdat. Everybody say eshdat. It's actually a it's a it's a conjunction of two words. It's a esh, which is fire, and dot, which is law. So what it literally says is he came with a fiery law for them. There's something about the Torah that is pictured by, by like the flame that comes out of a blowtorch, or a, a plasma torch, or, or even a campfire, or you know, our Arab Shabbat candles. When you look at a flame, there's something about that that is a picture of the Torah. Yeah, and uh, that's what he came, and that was in his right hand for them. Um, kind of sounds dangerous too, eh? Like a flaming, a fla- a fiery law. Um, I, I love how that concept is balanced in the next verse, 1 verse 3, very poetically, where it says, Av um, Moreover, indeed, he loves the people. 
So, you know, on the one hand, he, he comes with this fiery law that, that burns the garbage out of our lives that, yeah, it can be pretty painful, you know. Um, but on the other hand, at the same time, he, he loves the people. He comes, like, embracing us as his people. And I, I appreciate that, that balance that I'm sure each of us have experienced in our lives. Um, in that same verse, it says, they, uh, they followed in your steps. In the NASB, that's in 1 verse 3, and uh, I, I like how Arts Girl, the traditional uh, Jewish in, uh, interpreters have this. They render this as, they planted themselves at your feet. What, 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 what image from the Gospels does that bring to mind when you read that? They planted themselves at your feet. Well, for me, it reminds me of uh, Luke 10.39, where it says that Martha had a sister named Miriam who was seated at the Master's feet, listening to his word. So, you know, when we come here on Shabbat, when we read them from the Torah, uh, we can come with the heart of Miriam to just sit at the Master's feet, to, to gaze upon Him, to, uh, to learn from Him. You know, and uh, that's what I want to do. Like, I, 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 I'm not here to teach. I, I want to be a facilitator. I want to share some of the things that He has taught me so that we can learn from Him. You know? And, uh, and, and hopefully that's, uh, that's the uh, overtones of our teaching times. That's my... That's my heart's desire. Uh, in 1 verse 3 it also says, All your holy ones are in your hands. All your holy ones are in your hands. And uh, we read in, in Yohanan, John chapter 10, verse 28 to 30, Yeshua says, No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, He's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are Echad. One. So you just have this picture of, uh, of, of the Father and the Son you, uh, being Echad and just uh, each of us being in His hand. That's the picture we get from the Torah here. You know, I, I highly suspect that Yeshua again was referencing this parasha when he, was, uh, when he was quoting these things. And interestingly, yeah, enough uh, John 10, part of that chapter, uh, the context of it is, is Sukkot. Um, part of it is also Hanukkah, so, you know, they're kind of juxtaposed there. Um, there's one more phrase here that really uh, is a picture of Yeshua. Um, the next phrase in um, it's in one verse three or sorry thirty three verse three. It's, it says Yisa uh, me It says they received your utterances. They received your utterances. And uh, what, what, what that to me reminds me of is in Yochanan, John chapter seventeen verse eight, where it says where Yeshua is talking to Abba and he says, "For the utterances which you have given me, I have given to them, and they received them." So the utterances that you gave me, Abba, I have given to them, and they have received those utterances. So it's just, it's just incredible, hey? Like how each of these little poetic nuggets that Moses begins this blessing with, it's a picture of, uh, of discipleship, of our relationship with our Rabbi Yeshua. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's like this is the, the, the pinnacle of the Torah. And here, as we, as we reach the pinnacle of the Torah, we see this picture of Yeshua and the disciples, seated at His feet, receiving His utterances, being held in His hand, and uh, that, that's what, man, I, that's what Simcha Torah is all about, hey? Rejoicing in Yeshua, our Torah teacher. Um, 1 verse 4, song that we read, Torah, Tziva, Lanu, Moshe, um, Moshe, Kilat, Yaakov, uh, Moses charged us with the Torah. It's the, it's the possession, it's the inheritance of the assembly of Jacob. So uh, we were talking about legacy on more of a familial level, on a, on a faith community level, but uh, what about on a national level? Uh, wh- what is our national heritage according to the Bible? It's the Torah. And of course the Torah isn't only the Pentateuch, the foundational books, it's the whole thing. That is our inheritance on a national level. Um, Correlatively, what is the greatest legacy, therefore, that we can leave to future generations? Yeah, the Torah. Like, a deep love for the Torah. Which is something that, you know, it takes some cultivation. Yeah. Um, a lifestyle richly lived in concord with the commandments of the Torah. You know, where the rubber meets the road. How, how do we take the Torah and apply it to our lives? Because ultimately that will be one of the greatest legacies that we can leave to future generations. For your great-grandchildren to know that they had a great-grandmother, they had a great-grandfather who loved the Torah, who celebrated the festivals on an, on an annual basis, who, who made it a priority, you know, who waved the lulav on Sukkot. I mean, you know, just think about that. Your great-grandchildren are going to be waving the lulav on Sukkot. They're going to be praying the Hallel. I mean, like seriously, we are turning a new leaf that is going to impact generations to come. That really excites me. Wow. It's like, um, that's going to be so worth it to see that. Yeah. 
We can leave a legacy of a strong faith in the God who gave us the Torah. Here's an interesting verse. In uh, 33 verse 5, we read that uh, he became king in Yeshurun. Literally says in Hebrew, and this is how our art school renders it, that he became king in Yeshurun. When? When the heads of the people were gathered, the tribes of Israel together. Uh, what we learn from this verse is that, you know what, God is king in some places, and he's not king in other places. And there's a traditional Jewish commentator that says, uh, there's a difference between a king and a ruler. God is the absolute ruler. He, he governs the universe. Everything happens according to his will. But... Uh, but you know what? Rulers aren't always received on a popular level. It's more like someone who just functions to run the nation. A king is different. A king is someone like David, who was loved by the people, who was, uh, who was warmly received by the nation. And in that regard, God is not a king everywhere yet. Um, he's a king for those who have warmly received him. Um, Here's the question, when did he become king and Yeshurun? Because this may be a key to how he answers our prayer that his kingdom would come on this earth as it is in heaven. It says, when the heads of the people gathered together, when the tribes of Israel became unified. So we see a uni unity transpiring here in two stages. Uh, firstly, it says, when the nation's leadership came together, he became king over the nation. Uh, secondly, when the tribes of Israel, when each stream with its respective strengths became unified, then he became king. I believe this is a picture of the body of Messiah. It's a picture of how he is bringing us together. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, in many ways, Messianic Judaism is coming to the forefront of that just like Judah broke through as a breaker, um, as a forerunner, just as he went ahead when the tribes of Israel would journey, um, God is bringing the Jewish people in Messianic Judaism to the forefront in, uh, in, in um, the focus in the body of Messiah. And uh, we're part of that. Yeah, you're cutting edge. <laughs> um, so we see that happening. And uh, what's the final result? The full implementation of God's kingship. It is something that is happening today in the body of Messiah. So here, here, here's a couple of personal questions for our contemplation, and not only for us, but for those of us who are joining us via live streaming, for those of us who are going to hear, the, hear this teaching in the future. Uh, you know, as we, as we read that when God's people and the leadership of God's people come together, He becomes king over the nation. That is the point. Here are some questions. Do we have a bias, an essential bias for unity or division? Is our first response to gather together in unity based on our common salvation in Yeshua? Or is our first response to focus on our differences and divide? You know, deep down inside, everybody has a bias either towards one or the other. They would rather come together in unity uh, based on their common salvation or they would rather nitpick and, uh, and ultimately divide. And uh, that's just the way it is. I, I thank God. Like, I believe we have a very strong level of, of unity in our congregation. I really appreciate that here. It is, it's very refreshing. Honestly, like sometimes I'm blown away by our group. I'm so thankful that we have that. But that's something that we can be, uh, that we can keep in mind for the future also. Um, Messiah's kingdom will only fully come when his body is united. His people will be, and his people, they will be united. Because on his last night on earth, Mashiach requested it of his father. You know what? Some people don't want Yeshua's body to be united. Deep down inside, they would rather focus on the differences. They would rather have division. And uh, for people like that, I believe that they need to change their attitudes or they need to risk being taken out of the way. When Abba sets about answering his son's impassioned prayer that we on this earth become Echad as he is in heaven. Yeah. That's why I'm part of the ministerial here in Prince Albert. Um, yeah, like I have some ideological differences with some of the men in that room. I'm sure we all have some ideological differences. But my commonalities with those men are much greater than our differences. Especially guys like Pastor Greg. I love Pastor Greg. Like, I just, I feel such a kinship in the spirit. You know, with, 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 with quite a few of the men who are, who are serving the body of Messiah full time in the city. And uh, that's something God's really challenged me with, you know? Yes, the Torah is important. Yes, I fly the banner of Torah. But what is my core identity? My core identity is someone who has been saved through Yeshua. And that is something that I do have. That is a very strong common ground that I do have with believers in the city. Yeah. And you know what, the Torah part, you know, I can model that, I can share the meaning of it, and you know, you know um, things like that. People begin to be like, wow, that's cool, you know, I'm beginning to understand that over time, and, and uh, that, that's my optimistic outlook. Yeah, there is some unity in Islam, but there's also some massive disunity, you know, you have the, uh, the, uh, the extremists who are like, 
you know, bombing other sects of Islam, but yeah, and in Judaism too, you know, there there's um there's an impressive level of unity. I think to some degree because in Judaism it's more focused on how you do life, your practice of the Torah, rather than uh, some doctrinal minutia that we like to uh, obsess about and and divide over. So um. This picture of Yahweh becoming king in Yeshurun at the watershed event of the nation's leadership gathering together to hail his sovereignty. For me, it's reminiscent of David's coronation. Let me read you a passage from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1-3. to And just listen for these, uh, these, sim- these similarities. It says, uh, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. Do you know what Hebron means? It's from the, it's from the root uh, Chavar. It's the same root as like Chavarim, close friends, people who are bound together. They came to him at, at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and your flesh. Previously, when Shaul was king over us, you were the one who let Israel out and in. And Yahweh said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be a ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before Yahweh at Hebron. There, then they anointed David king over Israel. Wow. Yeah. Um, in, in Deuteronomy 33, verses 7, 26, and 29, we encounter a word that pops up in the very early chapters of Genesis as describing um, the, uh, the role that women get to play. In, uh, in their mission and uh, in families and uh, things like this. And uh, when we see this word in this parish, the way it's used, it really gives us a bigger understanding of this. And um, the, the word is ezer. We read it in um, verse 7 where it says, uh, it's talking about Judah. It's talking about intense combat situations. And it says, may you be a help against his adversaries. May you be a ezer against his adversaries. And that's the same word as uh, when it talks about Chava, how Chava, uh, Eve was created to be a, a helper, uh, an Ezer to Adam. And I, I want to read you a, a short section from uh, a book by uh, John and Stacy Eldridge um, called Captivating. You know, John Eldridge wrote a book called Wild at Heart for Men. It's a book that I have really appreciated. Um, they, they, they together wrote one for women also. And uh, I love his commentary on this. He, he and this is something I've noticed too. So, uh, but I, I like how he phrases it. I feel like he can say it better than me here. So I'll read this to you. He says, uh, When God creates Eve, he calls her an Ezer Kenegdo. It isn't good for the man to be alone. I shall make him an Ezer Kenegdo. Hebrew scholar Robert Alter, who has spent years translating the book of Genesis, says that this phrase is, quote, notoriously difficult to translate. The various attempts we have in English are helper, or companion, or the notorious helpmeet. <laughs> Why are these translations so incredibly wimpy, boring, flat, disappointing? What is a helpmeet anyway? What little girl dances through the house singing, One day I shall be a helpmeet? <laughs> companion? A dog can be a companion. Helper? Sounds like hamburger helper. Alter is getting, da- is getting close when he translates it as sustainer beside him. So this, this Hebrew scholar translates this phrase as sustainer beside him. Um, the word ezer is used only 20 other places in the entire Old Testament. And in every other instance, the person being described is God himself. When you need him to come through for you desperately. And then he lists several of those scriptures. Um, we're just we're just highlighting the ones from this parasha. It goes on to say, uh, most of the contexts are life and death, by the way. And God is your only hope. You're Ezer. If he's not there beside you, you're dead. A better translation, therefore, of Ezer would be lifesaver. Isn't that cool? So what God was to Judah in this passage, that is what a wife is to her husband. That is part of the role that the sisters get to play in the congregation. Not as like a servile doormat or someone who like, you know, is like uh, the janitor at home or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I mean like, you know, my wife does play, like my wife does do some of those things at home and I value her so much for that. But like the core of Ezer, of helper, is like a lifesaver, a sustainer. You know, when Judah was in the thick of battle, let's say... uh, 
the Maccabees when they were battling the, the Greek armies. And, uh, and I mean, like, people were getting chopped up. Like, there was blood flying. And Yahweh came through for Judah. And he helped him win. He helped save the day. He strengthened Judah. That is a picture of a wife. That is a picture of sisters in the body of Messiah. Like the lifesaver, the helper, the one who comes through for you when you really need it, when you're, getting, when you're going down. And uh, you know what? You know, for some guys, that's really humbling. Yeah. I mean, like, okay, when I, when I got married, I was extremely independent. Um, and you know what? Sometimes there's a pride that goes along with independence. And I really appreciated how even in Genevieve's in my re- relationship, like, her being my Ezer, the one who comes through for me when I'm in a crumple, the one who saves the day for me so many times, the one who prays for me when like I feel like I'm gonna, I'm just, I just want to give up and throw, throw my, t- throw the tour out the window and walk off, you know? Like, man, like Genevieve's my Ezer. Like, I'm, I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for her, you know? So, th- so this is, uh, this is something that we can learn from this passage that. Hopefully it's encouraging. Hopefully it helps uh, some of it come to life for us. Let, let's, let's look at a couple other pa- uh, sections here. In uh, 33 verse 8, I'm going to give you some Hebrew highlights here. 33 verse 8, it says, uh, For Levi, let your uh, tumim and your urim belong to your godly man. I really don't like that translation, godly man. The Hebrew word there is chasid. Everybody say chasid. It's like someone who is really devout. You know, just how God is chasid, he is devout towards us. We can be Hasid. We can be devout towards Him. And you're all aware, there's a movement in Judaism, the Hasidic movement. It's people who are really devoted to God. Is the essence of it. And so, you know what? I'm, I'm a Hasid. You're a Hasid. You know, that's an ancient term. Um, that's not just talking about a, a movement in Judaism. Um, Paul, when he referenced Ananias, the man who came in and said, Brother Saul, you know, and laid his hands on him, he said that he was a devout man, according to the standards of the law. He, what he said is, Ananias, he was a chassid. He was chassid. Yeah. So, anyway, I, I really appreciated that. That was, that was a hallmark of Levi. That was something that made Levi a priest. A, a, a person who had influence in Israel. A person who had that authority to bless the nation and uh, enable them to prosper, to succeed, to, uh, to grow, to experience the light of God. Um, in 33 verse 9, with regards to Levi, it talks about his, uh, how he prioritized his relationship with God over all other relationships. And when he had a friendship or a relationship, Levi is a tribe, that was, uh, like he, it was opposed to his covenant relationship with the Almighty, then uh, he didn't axe his relationship with God, he axed the relationship that was detrimental to his spiritual life, is essentially what it's saying there. And uh, that's reminiscent for me of Luke 14.26, where the Master says, uh, he's talking about hating family members, he says, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own father and mother, and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yeah, and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Of course, we're not talking about emotional hatred. Right? But in Hebrew, the concept of hatred is like when you prefer someone over someone else. God is jealous for our hearts. He, he longs for us to prefer Him over every other person. You know? So if we're like really busy and uh, we just don't have as much time to spend with Him and we have friends calling us up and saying, hey, let's go and do some stuff. You know what? Well, touch the heart of God so deeply. When you say, you know what? I'm not going to go this evening. I haven't spent much time with God. I'm going to go spend a little time with him, you know. Um, maybe on Erev Shabbat, maybe we'll have demands on our time. But just to say, you know what, my priority, I have not had enough time to focus on my spiritual life. I haven't had time to draw near to Mashiach and intimacy. So I'm just going to cut everything out of my schedule and spend some time with him. Man, that is, that is a way to touch Yeshua's heart. And that will make you a Levite. That will make you a spiritual Levite. That will make you a priest who has that, that level of spiritual influence that's going to... Like, bring God's light to your neighborhood, to your uh, congregation. Um, my all-time favorite title for God is in this parsha. God has lots of titles, doesn't he? He has one name, but he has many titles. And uh, my favorite title for him is in this parsha. It's in Deuteronomy 33, verse 16. Um, he's, uh, he's called, uh, in Hebrew, Shochni Sne. Shochni Sne. And... Uh, Sna is a bush, and Shochni is a, like a dweller, someone who dwells in something. You know the root uh, Shechan, right, to dwell. The Mishkan, where he dwelt. This is the title of the Almighty. He's the bush dweller. Yeah. 
Did you get that? Your God is called, is named the bush dweller. Your God is the bush dweller. Okay. <laughs> like the question is, what does that mean? In terms of like how he operates, uh, uh, our relationship with him. Here's something I've observed, and tell me if this isn't true in your own life too. Often the highest epiphanies come in the midst of mundane contexts. You know, there's like a bush. There are tons of bushes in the desert. But you know what? That one, God's in that one. God speaks to you from that one. You know what I mean? It's like the greatest theophanies come in the midst of everyday life situations and ordinary people. Have any of you experienced that? You'll just be talking with someone and suddenly you'll be like, God is talking to me through that person right now. Or you know what? Like, there can be, there can be really cool ways that he talks to you. Maybe there's a, maybe there's even a billboard or a line from a song or something. Just one of those bushes that fly by as you're driving down the freeway, you know? And all of a sudden it's like, boom, he just speaks to you through it. That's the Shochni Sna. That's the bush dweller. Right? Yeah, Shochni Sna. And uh, you know what? Like when we really realize that that's our God, that sometimes he hides in bushes and he talks to us from bushes, it kind of brings you to life. Like it makes you more alert. It's like you never know when he's going to show up in a bush. And just some ordinary thing that, you know, happens in life, you know? So uh, let's walk through life with that expectancy. Kind of watching for him, you know? It's like, that, that bush is a little different. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little closer and check that out. What's, what's going on there? Um, so maybe you can, you can be asking yourself, what's your bush? Who is your bush? Um, you can keep your eyes open for the Mashiach. Uh, here, here's a passage from Sir Hashirim, the Song of, Song of Songs, that, that has really spoken to me in this last year. Uh, along those lines, in 2 verse 9, it says, uh, My beloved is like a gazelle, or a young stag. Behold, he's standing behind our wall. He is looking through the windows. He is peering through the lattice. It's the same idea. Where is he? He's behind the wall. Where is he? He's behind the lattice. Where are you going to find him? He's pretty close, but he's hiding. Right? Like Sukkot, yeah. So that's something that really uh, really speaks to me. Um, 33 verse 17, where it talks about Joseph, the sons of Joseph, for Ephraim and Manasseh, says that they're at the ends of the earth, the extremities of the globe. That just tells us that Joseph, and whoever is prophetically pictured by Joseph, i.e. Gentile believers in Messiah, we've talked about that in the book of Genesis, they're going to be found at the extremities of the globe. It's part of their mission. Uh, 33 verse 18, we read about the special relationship between Zebulun and Issachar. Zebulun, Zebulun, traditional Judaism has pointed out, is the businessmen. They're out there in their ships doing commerce. Um, Issachar are the Torah scholars. They stayed home and they studied the Torah on their tents. And they work together. There's this partnership between Zebulun and uh, Issachar. And uh, you know what? Sometimes Zebulun is tempted to look at Issachar and be like, Lazy bum sits there and studying Torah all day. You know, sometimes Issachar is tempted to look at Zebulun and being like, <laughs> unspiritual bum. So they're doing business all the time. But you know what? Each tribe has their own calling. Each of them works together and uh, they strengthen each other, right? So uh, we can respect each other's different roles in the body. We can uh, enter into a sacred partnership together. Um, we read about Issachar, how they were calendar experts. We covered that in our teaching on syncing with the creator of the universe. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. Um, Last, uh, here's the last thought from the parish, and I'll give you a couple quick comments on, from Paul also in Luke, and then we'll uh, try to wrap up pretty soon here, because it's almost lunchtime. In uh, 34 verses 1 to 3, it says that Moshe saw the whole land of Israel. It says specifically, Yahweh showed him all the land. This is a geographical impossibility. You cannot see all the land that's listed here from the top of that mountain. That was, uh, that was spoken. How did that happen? Here's an idea. We just read about it in the opening verses of Genesis. Did you notice that? Th th this is a mystery. This is a mystery. When was light created? Which day? Verse 3? The first day, that's correct. Yeah. When were the sun, the moon, and the stars created? The fourth day. So there was this creation of light that preceded the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, you know, traditional Jewish commentary says that that light, that's the stuff that the universe is made out of on an, like an atomic and a molecular level. And uh, actually, like, science will back that up to some degree. There's some speculation about that. Um, 
there's this concept that, like, on an atomic level, the universe is composed of light. Yeah. Atoms. Energy. Yeah. And uh, when did he create light? On the first day. So there's a and there's this um, there's this teaching in traditional Judaism. We don't know if it's true or not, but they say that like the universe was pulsing with light at the beginning, and when Adam and Eve fell, it's like they cut the physical dimensions off from that source of light. It's like that light that is the Shekhinah, that is the presence of God, it withdrew into the upper realms of heaven, and uh, we're kind of left like a little more physical almost than we used to be, or something. I don't know. It's a, it's a thought, but. Um, but what traditional Judaism suggests is that that light is still available to the righteous. We can walk in the light. We can see in the light of His countenance. And that is when we see truth. And you know what? On an experiential level, that does make sense. So that light is going to return when, in, in the Messianic era, where then there will be no sun, moon, and stars. Wow. That's true. Joseph is a type of Yeshua. I'm repeating, I'm repeating to you, by the way, not because I'm slow, but so other people on our live stream can hear. So, so that's true. Joseph is a type of Yeshua. And uh, there is that dream about all of those natural light sources bowing to him. And uh, you know, the Master also said in, in Yochanan 8, actually the context of Yochanan 8 is Sukkot. It's kind of cool. But he said, Ani Anochi or Haolam. I am the light of the cosmos, the universe, the world. The, t- the space-time continuum. Olam is translated all of those words, eh? So... Maybe the light is actually a person. Doesn't it say that like their lamp is the lamb? And this is Shemini Atzeret. It's like the eighth day. This is the day when we commemorate the cosmic eighth where we enter into like the renewed heavens and earth. Eh? This is cool. I feel like he's showing us something really special right now. So to bring, to bring that whole concept to bear on this last parasha though, how did Moses see all the land? He saw it in the light that is reserved for the Tzadikim. The, the righteous people of every generation. It's a prophetic light. It's a light from which you can see from one end of the earth to the other. It's a light in which you can see the Father's face. It's a light that shines on us through Yeshua, who, uh, you know, who, uh, Yeshua, who Moshe was pretty tight with. You know, Moshe and Yeshua, they were pretty tight. They talked face to face. We read in this parasha. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something I find fascinating. That's true. In a dream, you see not with your eyes, but with your mind, eh? Can we look at Acts for a sec? I'm just, I'm gonna give you an overview of a like, couple of the highlights. And, uh, this upcoming year, we are going to be reading through the remainder of the Brit Chadashah, the new, the new covenant scriptures. I'm excited about that. We're gonna hit Paul's letters. We're gonna hit the, uh, the letters of Yeshua's two brothers, uh, Yaakov and Yehuda, James and Jude. Um, wow. But, uh, for now, let's, uh, let's just look at these last chapters of the book of Acts. In uh, 27 verse 9, we read, Luke references, quote, the fast. The fast. Which fast is that? That fast, uh, uh, Bible commentators almost universally say that fast was Yom Kippur. Um, even the footnotes of the NASB here says, i.e. Day of Atonement in September or October, which was a dangerous time of year for navigation. Uh, this tells us something very Important. It tells us that Luke and Paul, even when they were traveling, still observed Yom Kippur. They still fasted for Yom Kippur. If they were of a mindset that some people are today, that the law is irrelevant to uh, New Covenant believers, that uh, those things are done away with, and the, fa- the feasts are uh, kind of appendages that we have dropped in our uh, evolution of faith or whatever. You know what? If they were of a mindset like that, Luke would never have written that. Luke only wrote that because he acknowledged the festivals because he practiced those things. Yeah, the fast was like a, like a pagan time in, in, in their travel calendar. And uh, there have been some people who said, well, maybe that's the fast of uh, Tisha B'Av, you know, the ninth of the fifth. Um, um, that's impossible because um, right after that, the winter storms set in on the, on the sea. And actually, we have internal evidence of that also in verses 11 and 12. 11 and 12, it says... Um, the harbor wasn't suitable for wintering. The majority um, reached a decision to put out to sea. So anyway, that's a very that's just one verse. It's a reference to the fast, but it is it is like that is a that is a that is a power packed verse. Eh? What it also tells us is that uh, the early believers followed the traditional Jewish understanding of what it means to afflict your soul. It means to fast. Yeah, 
and some other things. Repent, you know. Um, 28.46, I get such a kick out of this. It's a great example of how fickle the mob can be. We've kind of been talking about this on and off throughout the year. Um, so, uh, Paul, he's gathering wood. He's right there gathering wood, wood with everybody after they're stranded on the island. And uh, this viper comes out and it, it, it grabs his hand. And uh, the natives look at it and they say, this guy must be a murderer. You know, even he escaped, even though he escaped the shipwreck, God's going to get him. Justice is going to be served. And, uh, man, so cool. What does Shaul do? Instead of like freaking out, which is I'm sure what I would have done, he shakes the thing off of his hand into the fire and just goes about helping. And uh, they're like, everybody's watching him to see when he's going to drop dead. And he doesn't drop dead, so then they think he's a god. <laughs> so it's, it goes from like being like, man, that dude, he must be a murderer. Like, he must be really bad to being like, that guy must be a god. And uh, anyway, I just, I got a kick out of that. It's one of those like, <laughs> really funny moments. Um, 28, verse 23. We read that Shaul gave a, a midrash, an explanation from the Torah that lasted probably 10 to 12 hours running. And in it, it says he, uh, he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about God's kingdom and trying to persuade them concerning Yeshua from the Torah of Moshe and the prophets from morning until evening. So you know what? Here's a challenge. You know, this is something we do as a congregation. This is something we can really grow in. Um, it's a challenge to, you know what? Preach God's kingdom, but do it only from the Old Testament. Can you do it? Could you prove that Yeshua, that Jesus is the Messiah, only from the Old Testament? Could you preach a 12-hour sermon just from the Old Testament about the kingdom of God and the Messiahship of Yeshua? Wow. Yeah, like, Paul, for that reason, is one of my heroes. And uh, you know what? I mean, hey, we, we study through the whole Pentateuch on an annual basis. Like, we're growing in this area, hey? Yeah, and we're starting to see fruit. Even Shoshana, like your meeting that you had uh, this last week. Just, uh, that, that is really exciting. Um, Here's, here's the last, here's the last thought before we have Oneg. Um, no, sorry. One other thing, 28.17, Paul says, I mean, th- th- this is almost like a broken record in Acts. He says it over and over. He's answering false charges. And what does he say? He says, I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers. You know, often there's this pop understanding of Paul that he did everything against Jewish tradition, that he was totally against the customs of his fathers. But what we see here again is Paul saying again, going on record, guys, I have not been against Jewish tradition. I haven't been doing stuff against the customs of our fathers. So, you know, I I take Paul at his word. It tells me he must have still done the Torah. It tells me he still must have lived a pretty traditional Jewish life. Or he would have been lying when he said that. And uh, Paul wasn't a liar. Um... Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard the? Here's the last thought. Have you ever heard about people, folks who are so heavenly minded that they aren't of any earthly good? It's kind of a saying out there, right? Some people kind of get labeled with that. Um, here's another. Here's another concept. Proverbs 24 verse 10. It says, "This is very terse, punchy. If you falter in times of crisis, how small is your strength?" You know what it's saying is. You, you, what you're really made of isn't going to show until you uh, hit a crisis. And then what you're, the stuff you're really made of, that's when it's going to show. And if you crumple, you know, you weren't very strong to begin with, no matter how you came across or what you thought of yourself. Um, here, here's a quote from B.F. Westcott. Silently and imperceptibly, as we work and as we sleep, we grow strong or we grow weak. Until at last, some crisis shows us what we've become. Yeah. And uh, in this in this passage in Acts, we see a very serious crisis. Um, the ship was like going crazy for weeks on the ocean. Everybody thought they were going to die. Uh, Paul was on the ship, and uh, how did he handle himself? It tells us a lot about the stuff that Paul was made out of. It tells us about a lot about Paul the man. And uh, I just want to I want to give you six snapshots of Mashiach's emissary Shaul in action in the midst of real life danger in this parasha. And uh, I mean, we can all admire Paul in this regard. I, I like as a man especially admire Paul in this regard because I see that he wasn't just some like fragile Torah scholar who uh, freaked out in the face of danger or who just went and hid in the hold of the ship to pray when things were going wrong. Like, th- this is a, this is a, this is a, a Paul that we see as robust. 
that was engaged, that was a real leader, that was a, that was a man among men. I'll, I'll give you a couple of snapshots of this. Uh, 27 verse 10. It says, uh, Paul challenged them and said to the men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. You're dealing with a ship with almost 300 people. And Paul's right in there talking to the captain and the, and the seaman and saying, guys, I, I can see this is not going to go well. You shouldn't do this. He was, he was right there. Um, 27 verse 21. It says, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, this is gutsy. He says, men, you ought to have followed my device, advice and not to have set sail from Crete and uh, incurred this damage and loss. So I mean, not only does he have the guts to say uh, to the captain of the ship, you shouldn't make this decision. He goes on to say, you, you guys really should have listened to me when we were back in the harbor. <laughs> wow. Um, verse 25 he finishes by saying, uh, Keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. So here we have Paul encouraging the whole ship of people who are freaking out, who are discouraged, who, most of whom have probably abandoned all hopes of life, saying, Guys, keep up your courage. Chazak, men, chazak. This is, this is, this is um, some of the last pictures of Paul that we have. Um, verses 30 to 32. We'll just consider this like our Brit Chadashah reading here, these little passages I'm reading. 30 to 32, uh, it says, the, the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves can't be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. So what do we see from this? Firstly, Paul wasn't like hiding out in the ship's basement, like freaking out and praying. He was right there on the deck with like the wind going crazy, with the waves washing over the bow. He was right there with the sailors and the soldiers. And he was watching the sailors. When he, he was watching them sharp enough that when he saw that they were going to let down the ship, the, like the, uh, the little ship, and they were going to try and get away, he went to the centurion and he said, if you, if you let those guys get away, none of us are going to make it. I mean, I, I assume the sailors hated Paul's guts at that point. I assume they probably wanted to grab him and throw him overboard, right? But uh, that's Shaul. He was, he was right in the thick of things. Uh, 33 to... That's true. I don't know, maybe he felt some fear, fear too, but you know, at some point he said that an angel appeared to him and uh, gave him a message, and he said, so guys, be encouraged, hey? Um... 33 to 34. It says, Until the day was about to dawn, uh, Shaul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore I encourage you to take some food, for this is your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. So here's a man who is caring for the people around him. He's saying, guys, you haven't eaten in two weeks. You need, you need to have some food before we... Because, be, you know, you need to have some food. He's like, he, he's, he's become a real leader on this ship. And uh, I really love how in the midst of it all, he can say, let's thank God for this food. Like, that's a powerful testimony, hey? That was backed by a powerful life. And uh, then the last snapshot, the last vignette that we have of this... Uh, of this dynamic emissary is in 28 verse 5. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. We already mentioned that, but like, he wasn't even phased when a snake clamped on him. He must have really known our rabbi's promises about snakes, like, not inflicting any significant damage on us, hey? I don't know, or maybe he just had a massive faith that was like crazy. So anyway, uh, that, 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 those are the parting scenes that we have of Shaul. And uh, what a legacy he has left to us as a Messianic community. Um, I'm really looking forward in this upcoming year to in studying through his letters, um, studying the, the heart of this man, uh, studying what it was that, that moved him, studying his vision of Mashiach. That's going to be, that's, I believe that's going to be a, a life-changing experience for us. Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you and your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. 
Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together, and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.